the great news of the gospel. We're up to chapter 8. It begins this way. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You remember the backdrop. We talked about it last time. The failure, the absolute failure of Saul of Tarsus to keep the law. What a downer, miserable man that I am. Who's going to rescue me? I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do. Oh my goodness, this is awful. There's something at work inside of me that is keeping me from victory. It's no longer I who do it. It's sin working inside me. Ouch, man, I cannot escape. This stinks. I'm miserable. And then salvation occurs. And the first thing he has to say about salvation is that Jesus has set him free and there's now no condemnation, no shame, no blame game, no guilt trip, nothing of a track record about your past. All of a sudden, you go from misery to joy. You go from guilt to glory. You go from wrongdoing to righteousness. An incredible transformation. And Paul is pumped about it. He's excited. And today we're in Romans 8, and it begins this way with this beautiful proclamation. No condemnation for you. And he continues, and he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Remember that law of sin and death. We talked about how it was like the law of gravity. What goes up has to come down, and sin deserves death every single time. But you know the gospel. The gospel sets you free from that law. You're no longer under the law of sin and death. You sin, but you don't experience death. You still experience life. You can't sin your way out of salvation. God's already said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Even if you're faithless, he remains faithful. There's no condemnation. Nothing separates you from the love of Jesus Christ. So when you sin, you don't experience death. You still experience life. And so it's like superseding the law of gravity. It's like the Wright brothers when they decided they could fly. The, the, the forces that are exerted on the underside of that wing at least give the appearance that gravity is not working for that airplane. It's going up, not down. And in actuality, spiritually speaking, there is a greater law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus died and he took the wages and there are no more wages. So that's how you always experience life. Even when you sin, you're still in the life of Christ. You might be miserable, but you're in the life of Christ and the life of Christ is still in you. Today and always, you have eternal life, not temporary life. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, past tense, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So what the law could not do, God did. I want you to focus in particular on these words that have been bolded for you. God did by sending his son. Now, the reason I want you to focus on this phrase is because, first of all, it's in past tense. Second of all, it's going to connect. It's going to connect with the next verse. And that's going to be really important because I've heard people talk about the next verse kind of like it's a progressive thing. But in the next verse, we're going to see that it's connected to this verse. And it's something that God already did so you don't have to do it. Watch this. God did it, sending his own son, it says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I've heard it taught 
Uh, see, you're going to fulfill the law. If you just walk right, then you'll be a law abider. If you just walk right, you'll be a law fulfiller. God's going to help you fulfill the law. Now you've got the Holy Spirit, so now you can really do it. And that is not what Paul is teaching. Paul is no dub double talker. Paul is not going to say, you're dead to the law, but you need to fulfill it. Christ is the end of the law, but you need to fulfill it. You're not under the law, but you still need to fulfill it. Do you see how that's double talk? It's nonsensical. It's confusing. It creates a gray area, and it's odd, and it doesn't line up, and it doesn't make sense, and nobody can live it out. And so what we're really seeing here is verse 3 and verse 4 form a thought together. And what he's saying is God did this, past tense, by sending his son so that, let's read it together, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. All right, there you have it. Why did he do it? So the law might be fulfilled. When did he do it? 2,000 years ago. Did he accomplish it? Yes. How did he do it? By the sending of his son. And what was accomplished? The law the righteous requirement of the law was fully met or fulfilled in you. Who are you? You're a person now who doesn't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So if you hear what I'm saying, please do not believe the lie that if you just walk by the Spirit enough, if you just work really hard at walking by the Spirit, that you're going to fulfill the law of Moses. No way, that is not the meaning of verse 4. You cannot look at verse 4 in isolation because it is connected to verse 3. And the point of verse 3 is this. God already did it. He did it through Jesus. And he did it so that the law would be fully fulfilled in you. And it has been. It's just like if I were to say I went into Starbucks yesterday to order a coffee. I went into the coffee shop yesterday so that I might drink a coffee. Did I go in? Yes. When did it happen? Yesterday. Why did I do it? So that I might buy a coffee. Did I buy a coffee? Yes, I'm telling you, that's why I went there. And we know the story. Jesus did hang on the cross. He did rise from the dead. God did send his only begotten. And now he's just giving us the reason. And the reason is so the law would be fulfilled in you, and it has been. And now he's describing you. You are a person with a new walk. You don't walk the way you used to. You walk differently. Now you get the privilege of walking according to the Spirit. Do you see it? It's fulfilled. It's fully met. You don't have to try to meet the requirements of the law. That is not the Holy Spirit's agenda with you. He is not helping you keep the law of Moses. He is helping you bear the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the law. And so we see right here in verse 5, For those who are, according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are, according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, growing up, I used to believe this, this chapter was about all the choices we Christians need to make. Hey, you better, you better set your mind. You better set your mind on the Spirit. You better think good and act good. I thought this was about choices that the Christian needs to make. But now, looking more carefully at the verbiage here, do you notice he's actually describing two kinds of people? Type number one, those who are, are according to the flesh. And those who are according to the Spirit. That verb are there, I've highlighted it, bolded it, underlined it for a reason. He's not just talking about some way to act. He's talking about who you are. Either you are according to the flesh or you are according to the Spirit. This is nature talk. And so he's describing a trend. I often say it's a tendency or a trend or a trendency, if I can invent that word. It is a trendency 
In the unbeliever, those who are according to the flesh, guess what they do? They have a tendency to set their minds according to the flesh. Of course they do. It's all they know. And then we have a new trendency. As believers, we have a new trend, a new tendency. And that is that we now set our minds according to the Spirit. Because that's who we are. We are according to God's Spirit. So this is not a a prescription. It is a description of two kinds of people. And this is going to be so very helpful as we continue in Romans 8. Again, don't read Romans 8 as a bunch of stuff that you need to do. What we are talking about today is two kinds of people. And Paul is contrasting them. And one group has no condemnation for them. Now, let's continue. He says, for the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Is there something to be said here for Christians? Of course. I mean, set your mind on the Spirit. Think God thoughts. Allow Him to renew your mind. And you'll enjoy life and peace, which is your destiny. It's what you're made for. But this idea of experiencing death. Only the unbeliever experiences death. You have the life of Jesus. So if there's any takeaway in this contrast of the two kinds of people... Here it is. There's two kinds. There's those who are according to the flesh and those who are according to the spirit. Now, those who are according to the flesh tend to think that way. They tend to think fleshly. Those who are according to the spirit tend to think spiritual thoughts. Now, if this group over here decides that they want to think the old way for a second, for a minute, for an hour, if they decide they're going to adopt an old attitude, It's not going to work. There's no peace and there's no life in that for them. Do they die spiritually? No, they don't experience spiritual death. But there is a natural consequence of thinking the old way. And that's why we need our minds renewed. Now, even though that's true for our decision making every day, let's not lose sight of Paul's purpose in this passage. He is still contrasting two kinds of people, and the two tendencies, the tendency of each group because of the nature they possess. Now, he says, because the mindset on the flesh, get this, is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Now, again, how confusing it would be for us to think that this is about a Christian. He's still in the contrast, and he's now focused. He's turned that focus, shifted it. He's zooming in on the unbeliever, and he is saying the unbeliever's mind cannot please God, is not even able to please God. And that person cannot keep the law, which is, by the way, reminiscent of Romans 7, remember? Romans 7, he couldn't keep the law. So again, this is connected and intertwined, and Paul is contrasting the unbeliever with the believer. And here in verse 7, he's focused exclusively on the unbeliever, and he's saying the unbelieving mind cannot please God and cannot keep the law. Paul knows that firsthand from his experience. And those who are in the flesh, verse 8, cannot please God. Wow. Can you please God? Yes, you can. You can please God. You can bear fruit and you can please God by having faith in Him. But some people can't please God. Do you know why? Because they're in the flesh. They're in Adam. They're unregenerate. They're not born again. Now we're really delving into the true meaning of this passage. It's about two kinds of people. One kind can please God, and the other kind can never please God. However, he says, changing gears, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know, sometimes I'm in the flesh. 
And sometimes I'm in the Spirit. You know, I try to be in the Spirit, but a lot of times I fall back in the flesh. No, you don't. You are not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit, always. You don't always think according to the Spirit. You don't always set your mind according to the Spirit. You don't always walk according to the Spirit, but you're always in the Spirit. That's your location. That's like real estate. That matters. Location, location, location. You're always in the Spirit. There's two ways to walk, but you've got one location. And that is exactly where the conflict arises, right? When you start walking in a way that contradicts who you're in. You start acting in a way that contradicts your location. In other words, you start acting like a person that you're not. For example, I live in Texas. I abide in Texas. I'm a Texas resident. I'm a resident of this state. But what if I were to talk like I'm from Boston? I put on a little Boston accent. I Maybe Connecticut. I park the car. See, I can talk like that. Maybe for a, a few seconds, a few minutes at most. But it doesn't make me a resident of Connecticut, a resident of Boston. And so you see that I can talk in a way that contradicts my location. I can walk in a way that contradicts who I really am and where I really live. And so it is spiritually. You, you can live in Christ and yet talk or walk in a way that contradicts who you live in. And that's what he's saying here. Let me read the passage again. He says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So that's every Christian. Every Christian is a person who has the Spirit of God in them. And if the Spirit of God dwells in you, then you are not in the flesh. You've got a new location. You, my friend, have moved to Texas. And everything's big in Texas, right? But seriously, you've moved out of Adam into Christ. You've moved out of the flesh into the Spirit. Now you're, you're, you're in this new location and you've got a new way to walk and a new way to talk. And it's according to the Spirit whom you're in. This is your citizenship. You've got new residency and it matters. Two ways to walk, but one permanent location but if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he does not belong to him there's a group of people out there teaching a falsehood a lie it goes a little something like this hey it's great i love it it's great that you're a christian but now you just need the spirit it's great that you're born again i love that you understand the gospel it's great that you're a christian but now you need a second blessing. You need a double portion. You need another blessing of the Holy Spirit. You need a second baptism. That's what you need. A spiritual baptism into the Spirit. That's a false teaching. And it's prevalent. It's very common. It's very popular. And yet here in Romans 8, Paul is blowing it to smithereens. He's dashing it against the rocks. He's exposing it for what it is. He says, whoever belongs to God, has the Spirit. If you have the Son, you have the life. If you have the life, you have the Son. You can't have the Son without the life. You can't have the life without the Son. You can't belong to God without the Spirit. Every Christian has the Spirit of God living in them. There is no second portion. We're told that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We have everything we need for life and godliness. Could you have everything you need except be missing the Holy Spirit? That makes no sense. Could you have every spiritual blessing but be missing the baptism of the Spirit? No. You have everything and every blessing and all you need. And if you belong to God, you have His Spirit. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, you say, how is the body dead because of sin? Well, we live in a fallen world. You're going to get a new body. This old body is going to become miracle grow. It's going to become fertilizer. It's going back to dust, back ashes to ashes. 
it's out of here at some point, and you get a new resurrection body. So clearly, the body is impacted by sin, and it's fallen, and it has limitations. Yes, your body is holy, and it's precious to God, and it's the temple where God dwells and expresses himself. At the same time, there's a reason why you and I are getting a replacement. Amen? Don't you want a replacement? I do. I'm looking forward to that resurrection blood that doesn't have high iron. I'm looking forward to the resurrection physique that doesn't get exhausted by 9 p.m. Aren't you looking for that resurrection body that's not susceptible to illness? It's something to look forward to. But there's something else here, and it's in the second half of this verse. Even though the body is dead because of sin, it says the spirit... Not the Holy Spirit, but your spirit, the human spirit, the Christian's inner man, the spirit of the believer. Look at what it says. Read it carefully. Is alive because of righteousness. Now, not too long ago, we celebrated Easter. And it was a lot of fun to talk about the resurrection and that you have resurrection righteousness and that you have a real righteousness, that your righteousness is not just you know, imputed, but it's actually imparted, given to you. And this is another passage that says that same thing. Read it carefully with me. It says, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. You know what that tells me? You, my friend, have a living righteousness. You are righteous because your spirit is alive. You're not just clipboard righteous. You're not just righteous in heavenly bookkeeping. You're not just righteous in the way that God sees you as if he's pulling the wool over his own eyes, faking himself out with Jesus glasses, pretending you're righteous. No, you are righteous because your spirit is alive. You have a spiritual life righteousness. You are righteous because Jesus gave you his life That means he imparted life to you. He shared life with you. It's not just imputed, credited, but it's actually imparted, given, shared. It's real. If we were to cut you open on a spiritual operating table, you would ooze righteousness at your core. You are alive and you are righteous, and you are righteous because you're born of God. He gave birth to you. The Spirit of God gave birth to a kid, you, and that's why you're righteous. It's genetic. It's in the DNA. It's in the bloodline. It's the lineage. It's the heritage. Do you hear what I'm saying? The words that are coming out of my mouth right now, because this is not heard very often to be candid, What you grew up with was, oh yes, justification by faith, yes. Every Christian knows we're justified by faith, just as if we've never sinned, justified. That's great, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about God treating you as if there's an absence of sin. I'm not talking about just some generic doctrine of you being justified by faith, I'm saying that you are genetically different than your next door neighbor. I'm saying that spiritually, at the core of your being, you don't look like some other people that are walking the planet. And if you think I'm just talking about Jesus living in your heart, I'm not. I love that Jesus lives in your heart. But what does your heart look like? The fabric of your heart the DNA of your spiritual heart. What do you look like? What does your spirit look like? Jesus is righteous. That's great. He always has been. That's not a newsflash. You want to know the newsflash? You're actually righteous. Now that is some crazy, wild stuff, isn't it? And that's the truth of the gospel. It's that radical. To be born again is not just some phrase. It's not a political position. It's not conservative values or family principles. To be born again means your spiritual personhood 
has been swapped or exchanged out with the old, in with the new. You're really righteous. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I used to think this was about getting the new body. You know, I would read this, gloss over it. Okay, yeah, 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 I get it. Jesus, you know, rose from the dead, came out of the tomb, had the new body. Someday we'll have a new body, and that's what he's talking about. Nope, that's not what he's talking about. It says mortal body. It doesn't say new body. It says he'll give life to your mortal body, which is your current body, which you possess right now. So what is he saying? You have life in you, and he will express that life through you. You don't have to wait till heaven. Through your arms and your legs and your eyes and your smile and your hugs and your treatment of other people. Even though this body is decaying, which he said a few verses ago, remember, it's going to be miracle grow. It's going to be fertilizer. It's going to end up in a casket and buried in decay. It'll take seven years in the ground or seven minutes in an oven, but it is toast. But, even though that's true, right here, right now, the body that you have, God's going to use it to express His life through you in the here and now. Even though it's decaying, because it's a fallen world, He will give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who indwells you right here, right now. Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing to think about? Wherever you go, you can be an expression of Jesus. Wherever you go, you can share life with other people. You get to be not an obstacle, but an instrument. You're not in God's way. You get to be yourself and express Him at the same time. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He says we're under obligation. Who's he talking to? To everybody reading the letter, to his Jewish brothers, to his Christian brothers. There are Jews in Rome who will hear this read aloud. Many Jews are reading this letter. Many Romans are reading this letter. And so it's written to anybody and everybody, if the shoe fits, you wear it. But my point is this. He's saying, look at this gospel. Look how amazing it is. We're under obligation, man. Have you heard this, this incredible message? We're under obligation then to hear it and believe it and live. Because if you're still living according to the flesh as an unbeliever, you must die. All you can experience is death. And in fact, you are dead in Adam. And there's nothing ahead but death. But if you hear the gospel and you believe it, then guess what? You live and you are putting to death the deeds of the body. Remember sin, that parasite sin that could work through you? No more. There's a new way to live. You can put to death the deeds of the body, no longer offering your body to a parasite, but instead offering your body to God. It's a contrast of two kinds of people on planet Earth. You're different than the guy next door. You're made for so much more. You're a new creation. The Spirit of God lives in you. You could offer your body as a tool, just like a hammer, for destruction or to build something amazing. So how about you offer your body to God instead of offering it to sin? That's the logic. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling, because look at your calling. Whoa, look at your calling. You're holy and righteous and blameless, and you're God's kid, and you've been invited to His table, and you belong to Him, and He'll never let you go, and look at your mission and your purpose and your calling. So, let's walk in a manner that's worthy 
of our incredible calling. Let's wear what's fitting for saints. If we live by the Spirit, let's walk by the Spirit. It just makes sense. Look at who you are. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. This is not wishful thinking. This is not a command. This is not a prescription. He's not saying, please, I need you to be led by the Spirit. That's not what it says. Read it carefully. It's a statement. It's a blanket statement. Let's read it together again. Is it a command? No. Watch for it. It is a description of who you are. He says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You know what that means? That means you are being led. Every Christian is being led. If you're a son of God, you're being led by the Spirit. If you're a child of God, a daughter of God, you are being led by the Spirit. You don't always listen. We don't always walk. We don't always talk. We don't always set our minds the way that the new trendency within us is, is catapulting us toward. We don't always go with the flow of God's Spirit, but He's always leading. He never stops leading. So, you can't be a Christian and be led later. You're led right now. God is eager. He has cleaned house, and He has moved in, and He is eager, and He wants nothing more than to counsel you and tutor you and guide you into all truth. you got to know He's in you, and He's real, and He cares, and you're qualified because He qualified you. Every child of God is led by the Spirit. All right, we'll finish with this. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. You're not a slave. You're a son. You're a daughter. It's not just adoption. You're also born of the Spirit. Adoption is a beautiful picture. It's an image to be adopted by God. But Romans also tells us you're born of God. You're born of the Spirit. You live from the Spirit and in the Spirit. You had the old self die and you're a new creation. It's genetic. It's adoption, but it's genetic, but it's adoption, but it's genetic. And it's both. And it's awesome. And His Spirit, which is God's Spirit, bears witness with your spirit, which is a human spirit. Look, you're mine. You belong to me. You're different now. You're not who you used to be. You're way more than that. You're above sin. Sin is beneath you. You're dead to sin. You're alive to me now. Have you been wondering what God's agenda is with you? What if he just wants to show you how amazing his gospel is? What if he wants to show you how amazing you are in him? His spirit bears witness with your spirit. He's trying to tell you something every day. You can wake up and be convinced by the Spirit that you belong to God. You're His kid now and always. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this reality that we have a new location transferred out of Adam into Christ. We got a new walk, we got a new talk, we got a new way to think and act. And it just makes sense. We'll never be in the flesh again. We're always in your spirit. We thank you for this new location. It means we have a new source for living. It means we have a new way, a whole new way to operate. We thank you for life in your spirit that will never end, that you'll never let us go. No matter what we're going through, we're united with you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.